to the car. Now. Okay, it's it? recording now. Good. Thank you. Ooh, okay. You hear yeah, his lovely voice. Enzyme, very appropriate <laughs> RNA. Are you You're muted? Yes, you do. And one of the RNA enzymes yeah. you're supposed to know. For the okay, thank time. you so much. Sorry, I was late. Well, activation forgot. energy by decreasing number of proteins required. I agree now. Okay, that sounds good. Confirmed. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Bye. But it is in the Bye. exon. Yes, it is. Wouldn't you need to increase collisions to speed up a, an exon? <laughs> I know what you meant already. Um, no, and I'll tell you why. I see what's happening here. So here you go. Here I am. I'm an enzyme, right? I didn't mean to do enzymes today, but what the hell? You guys are like enzyme deprived, so I'll do it. Instead of being like this, so let's say A and B have to hook up just in this orientation, so like that, right? And oh, it's like that. Yeah, we're gonna make magic mushrooms because that's just how we roll. Remember, I was in the East Village for a lot of years. So when A and B hook up and make this, well, they had to align perfectly like that. So they bounce and they bounce all different ways and they bounce, bounce, bounce. And only when they hit like this. So the number of collisions required to ensure active site alignment is the activation energy, understand? But an enzyme says, hey, you, over here. Hey, you, over here. This is how you do it. And then I'm going to squish you together. Clear? So what does that mean? Seriously, Danielle, are you really killing me with this? So what does that mean when I stick these two together? I decrease. So what does an enzyme do? It decreases the number of collisions required. So that's what the activation energy. If activation energy is the number of collisions required, this decreases it. And that's why it lowers the activation energy. Because an enzyme will decrease, it shows the orientation. I don't know. That was a good one. I, I think it was legit. Are stye the most common amino acids in the entire body? No. Stye are the most common amino acids in the active side of an enzyme for the 13th time. Serine, threonine, tyrosine are the most common amino acids in the active site of an enzyme, and that's because they all have hydroxy groups. And we phosphorylate hydroxy groups, booyah, and hydroxy groups attack carbonyls. So that's why S-T-Y, and we're going to do this more later, and I didn't really want to do it right now, but I opened the can of worms, so I guess I'll close it. Got it? So sty, serine, threonine, tyrosine, for the 13th time, 14th time, actually, because it's been tested so many freaking times. Can you typically use the same enzyme for the reverse reaction? Um, typically, absolutely. Almost always, Sarah. Very few enzymes are, are reversible. Very few enzymes are reversible. And when they do, any reversible enzyme are controllable. So, yeah, typically the enzyme is controlled by what's next on my list, baby. Enzymes are controlled by Le Chatelier. Got it? So, no, enzymes are not controlled by Alistair's inhibitors. Enzymes are controlled by Le Chatelier's principle because most enzymes go back and forth. So if I'm going A to B, back and forth, what's going to control whether I go to A to B or B to A? Say it again, loud and proud. Le Chatelier. Got it? I think it was Miss Sarah. Miss Sarah, so enzymes, when you have an enzyme that only goes one direction, then that's going to be controllable by outside sources. So it won't matter how much A and B you have in this case. It's going to matter on other things and the things that control it, which we won't get into, but of course i got to tell you, are the ratios of NADH to NAD, ATP to ATP. MP, and insulin to glucagon. So that's going to come when we do biochem. So long story short, most enzymes are just controlled by the shot layer principle. But in every pathway, there's one, two, or three regulating steps. Got it? Good. Yes, they're out of steps. Okay. Now, back to <laughs> long story short. I'm doing this to cover delta G, but that's all good. So now we got a little bit, little bit extra for experts, and we're going to do enzymes in bio, so in biochem as well. <clears throat> so you'll see a lot of this again, but not this chart because it's adult G. Okay, well, let's take a pretty look. If I had two paths like this, oh, that's a blue, that's a blue uh, reaction. And then I'm going to give you another reaction because I like you guys. And here's a, a fuchsia. So a plum, I will go plum. I actually think it's better. I think fuchsia is more like, a, like, like that. That might be more fuchsia. So we'll go plum. Glad we had this talk. Sorry, guys, I'm just giddy. Why? Woo! New president today, baby. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Inauguration went off without a hitch. Thank goodness, man. Woo! Had to get it off my chest there. Oh, thank goodness. No, no problems at the uh, inauguration. Thank goodness. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go, America. Back to work. Well, he actually sounded good today too. He didn't sound like he was gonna fall asleep. So. I was excited. <laughs> and J-Lo looked awesome, of course. Really? I, I, I don't know how you people didn't watch the inauguration. I don't know what the hell else you're doing, but it was, it was phenomenal. 
Um, okay, so blue versus plum. Which one of these happens faster, the blue or the plum? Which one happens faster? I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. No, you don't know. Can't say. Well, then I can't say because you're not allowed to or can't say because you don't know. You don't know. You have no freaking clue because you don't know the what. You don't know how tall the hump is. So if I give you a big-ass hump, look at that hump. Ooh, my God, that's a big hump. And I gave you a little tiny hump. Hello, little hump. Now you can tell me clear as day which reaction happens faster, which reaction takes less collisions. The plum happens faster. So what I'm telling you is activation energy is directly related to rate, yes or no? Inversely, thank you. Related. It's related. <laughs> it's related. It's one over rate. Very good. So the blue has a higher activation energy, hence requires more collisions for active site alignment. Hence, will have a slower rate. We good? I feel like we saw something. Maybe if I turn this down a little bit. Maybe I'll adjust my gain. I'm going to adjust my gain for you guys. Is, it, is the mic any better? Or is it, am I still underwater? You can hear, but it sucks. Underwater. Shit. <laughs> okay. I promise I'll fix it tomorrow. I'm, I'm like totally paranoid about not having perfect freaking technology. All right. Here we go. Now. Which reaction is more favorable? Which reaction is more favorable? I'm blue, wish I were green, but I'm blue. Why would you think plum, Carly? Where's that, where's that crap coming from? Let's, let's adjust that shit. You need, Carly, you need an attitude adjustment. Where, where, where's that plum coming from? Just be, I drew it on purpose really low. So, so, David, you need to fix that shit, too. That's just wrong. So, David said it's the blue because it's a bigger delta G. <laughs> well, Scott, I meant bigger negative. <laughs> God, no, that's not a thing, dude. The negative, the blue has a lower delta G any day of the week. Got it? Minus 1,000 is a smaller number than minus 100 any day of the week. They love, okay, everybody, get your heads out of your butt and pay attention right now. Listen, this is a, a kind of annoying thing. Nobody in science says bigger negative. That's not a thing. You say it in your brain, and that's fine. So the blue, I agree, the blue has a bigger negative. They, got it, but that's not a thing. So the delta G for blue versus the delta G for plum, which one's a bigger delta G? Plum is a bigger delta G. It's, it's less negative. You understand? Products minus revenue. So let's say blue, I don't know, is delta G of minus 100, and let's say plum is minus 10. So which one's a bigger, bigger number? Well, obviously, Scott, minus 10 is a bigger number. Well, if minus 10 is a bigger number, then you can't tell me that it's bigger. You understand? The only thing that matters in determining whether a reaction is more favorable is the, dis the difference between products and reactions. So the bigger difference, it doesn't matter how low we can go. Do you understand? That's why I put it low like this. So now, listen, if I asked you who's more favorable, who would you tell me? I'm blue, wish I were green, but I'm blue. Yes, the blue. So blue is more favorable. And more favorable means what? A bigger negative delta G. <laughs> a smaller delta G. Are we clear? Because it's more negative. But they're not going to say bigger negative. That's not a thing. You can say blue is more spontaneous. Now, which one is going to have at equilibrium, which one is going to have a greater products to reactive ratio? Who's going to have more products and reactions? The top is going to have a greater product to reactant ratio. Why? Yeah, the top blue is going to be bigger product to reactant ratio then is plum. And that is because there's a big difference in delta G. It's more favorable to get from reactants to products. That's why. You understand? So if that's true, which it is, that means that what is the product reactant ratio? Is there a thing for that? Yes, it's called KEQ. So the KEQ of the blue is certainly bigger. The KEQ for the blue is certainly bigger because the product reactant ratio is greater than the plum. Are we feeling this? Now, if all that's true, which it is, really is true, then what's the relationship between delta G and KEQ? Is there one? Yes. Oh, there's a big-ass relationship, Julia. That's not a good answer. Minus RT, natural log of KEQ is correct, but I'm asking, is it direct, indirect? What's the relationship? Positive or negative slope if I'm plotting delta G and KEQ? 
If you have a really, really, really large KEQ, so let's bring this home, really large KEQ means you're very favorable, means you're very spontaneous, it means you have a big melt, big negative. <laughs> so if you're very, very low, you have a small delta G because you have a big negative. But they're not going to say big negative. That's not even a thing. Got it? Just not going to say it. They could say the magnitude of delta G. I mean, I could do that, but not so much. So what should the slope be, positive or negative slope? It's going to be a negative slope. It's going to be a negative slope, but it's not going to be linear, and it's not going to be linear because there's a natural log here. Should you know this equation? Yes, that's why I wrote it. Okay, long story short. Delta G, KEQ are going to have relations with each other. They are related. But not, what is R, what, which R is that? Oh, this is any R you want it to be. What do you mean? It's the R depending on your units. 8.314 or 0 0.08, you know, whatever you want it to be. But usually 8.314 when it's chemical equilibria and usually 0 0.0821 when it's gas. So del G, K, E, Q are related, but not related to these guys. So once again, this is a major, major point, folks. Del G and K, Q are related to each other, but just because you have, just because the reaction wants to have a big product reactive ratio doesn't mean it happens fast. So delta G and K, Q are related inversely. I should write that. Whereas, and not linear. I should write that too. Oh, I'm writing it. Look at this. And then E, <laughs> activation energy rate, inversely rated. I like it. I feel like that's a thing. Okie dokie. That was fun. Now, Le Chaudelier. Le Chaudelier principle is fun. Ready to have some real fun? A plus B goes to C. If I add A, it's going to go to the right. If I add C, it's going to go to the left. If I take away C, it's going to go to the right. And this, this is what we do. We couple reactions, and we get rid of C, and we drive reactions that way, right? That's how we can drive reactions by getting rid of one of the uh, products. So fast way to speed up a reaction, get rid of the products. Now, what if I increase the pressure? What will happen to this reaction right here if I increase pressure? No, you can't access these notes. What if you increase pressure? What happens to this reaction? Which pressure? Any pressure you want. The pressure of the chamber, dude. What do you mean? The pressure in your life. What? 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 No, you have no idea. You don't know. You have no idea. <laughs> Well, Scott, I like to think of everything in the universe as a gas. <laughs> you don't know what they are, folks. They, you have no freaking clue. Do we understand? Are we dealing with gases? I agree. So the point is this. When you have high pressure, you alleviate gas. <laughs> got it? So when you have a lot of, you got a pressure buildup, alleviate gas. Just let it go, and we'll, we'll still love you. High pressure, we shift away from the gases. What do you do with high pressure? You shift away from the gases. So here you don't know which one tire, which one are gases. But if I told you everybody's a gas, now you have two gases on the left, two gases and one gas on the right. Higher pressure, Le Chatelier says the KEQ is going to change and you're going to get more products. So Le Chatelier says high pressure, shift away from the gases. High pressure means low volume, same thing. So low volume, you're going to increase pressure, shift to the right. Got it? And vice versa, obviously, if it's low pressure, shift towards the high pressure, shifting away from the gas it makes sense. Low pressure, it's a little bit more thought, so don't think about it. Just always think in terms of high pressure, alleviate gas, and you'll be fine. Think of the high pressure, low volume. Okay, what does temperature do? What if there are two products? What if there are seven products? <laughs> what, what, if, what if God were one of us? <laughs> what, what do you want? If, the, if it's the same number of gas particles... So if we have Le Chatelier and we have the same number of gas particles on left and right, what would happen? No shift. So there'd be no effect. Got it? Is Alexander with us? As are you with us? Yeah, man. Well, all right. Well, all right. Well, all right. So here's two and here's one and then there's C and it's a solid and then there's two D and it's a gas. All right, if we increase pressure, which way is this reaction shift, left or right? Uh, let's, deep, let's, let's increase volume. If we increase volume, the reaction shift to the left or right? Look at you guys. No one wrote no shift. I love it. But what? One and two, but it's a solid. doesn't really look like an S. It kind of does look like a G. But I'm going to write solid just so we get here. Solids don't count. Don't count. 
So if we increase volume, that's the same as decreasing pressure. So if we increase pressure, right? I always do an increased pressure because it alleviate gas. Increase pressure this way, decrease pressure this way. So the answer to the question, original question was, not spicy, the original one, high volume, dip to the left because we had three gases and two gases. Had city been the gas, then there'd be no effect on it. Got it? Beauty. All right, does temperature affect KEQ? Yes. Does temperature affect KEQ? I forget. Yes. Good. So now let's say that we had A plus B and I'm going to do A little C and I'm going to say plus heat. First of all, it's called exothermic heat, right? Exothermic. Um, next thing. So here's where I'm getting a little confused. If I increase temperature, if I increase temperature, what happens to the rate of this reaction? The heat's over here, so what's going to happen? If I increase temperature, what's going to happen? Look at all these crazy answers. See what happens? <laughs> oh, my God. Look at all these crazy answers. You're all giving me all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and you're giving me crazy answers. You're giving me answers that don't make sense. I'm asking about rate, and you guys are talking about products, you're talking about shifting. I don't give a shit. I'm not asking any of that. I'm not asking any of it. I'm asking one thing and one thing only. What the hell happens when I increase temperature? This reaction shifts. It's an exothermic reaction. Yeah, so it's going to do what? Yeah, Abby, I just said I don't care about which way it shifts. I want to know how fast I'm going to get to equilibrium. Oh, my God. Alex, stop it. I want a freaking rate. Stop giving me pressure, volume, and all this crazy shit. What are you guys doing? You have no idea anyway. They don't know if they're gases. <laughs> you want me to go faster? I want to really freaking answer the gases. Is that better, Spencer? Okay, so let's stop because you guys are killing me here. Here we go. Listen. 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 You can say very effectively that here's how it works. Particle collision is always what determines rate. And if I can get more collisions, I'm more likely to get a reaction to occur. If I can get more collisions, I'm more likely to get particles up to that transition state. Does everybody understand that? So let's try this. <laughs> there are special reactions called all reactions when I increase temperature and increase rate. Now, what I just did was scope shift, and they love to do this. They'll give you an entire passage explaining the shot air and heat, and the first question will be about temperature, and they'll give you an exothermic reaction. How about this? I'm going to go to the left. If I go to the left, it's got to be slower. No. No, it doesn't have to be slower. You're going to get the react. You're going to get the equilibrium. When you raise this temperature, you're going to get the equilibrium faster, period. Exclamation point. Yeah. And that's going to happen. Usually, about every 10 degrees doubles reaction rate. So temperature affects reaction, reaction rate, period. Has, rate has nothing to do with your shifts, your KEQs, nothing. Rate and KEQs are completely independent, folks. So for what kind of reaction does increase in temperature increase collisions? What kind of reaction? All. So therefore, if you increase collisions, aren't you more likely to have active site alignment? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so therefore, let's try it again. If I increase temperature, what happens to the rate of my reaction? Mm, well, that's what the rate is, Spencer. Yes, you get there faster. So if I ran this at lower temperature, would I get the equilibrium quicker or slower? Lower temperature, slower. Lower temperature, slower. Lower temperature, slower. What does this have to do with Le Chatelier's principle? What does this have to do with Le Chatelier principle? Nothing, 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 nothing. Yeah, Colin, we're not there yet. Nothing, 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 nothing. So let's understand this. If I increase temperature, what happens to rate of any reaction? It goes up. The temperature will not, the rate won't go up <laughs> when the temperature is so high that you destroy the products of reactants. Then it's not even considered a reaction, so it doesn't matter. You understand? So, like, you'll have, you know, okay, the rate goes up like this, like whatever, and there's going to be a point. But at that point, when it's just going to go back to zero because you destroyed your products and reactants. Got it? So that's, I mean, you can't go up in temperature forever because you'll denature your products and reactants. All right, and now that we get it a little bit. 
Increasing temperature, temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. If you increase temperature, you get more kinetic energy. Now, if I doubled the rate, how much did I change the temperature by? You have no freaking clue. We just know we, we increased temperature, or I added a catalyst. Let's say I didn't add a catalyst. I doubled the rate, I increased temperature. You don't know. You don't know. But what you do know is this, and this is kind of interesting. So what you do know, what does that mean, Daniel? You do know you overcame the hump. So if I doubled the rate, what did I do to the average velocity of any, remember, velocity is one half mv squared. What did I do to the average velocity of any given particle if I doubled the rate? Flat line. <laughs> I'm underwater, Scott Roberts. No, you have no idea. Terry, don't answer that. That's a trick question. Nothing. You just had more collisions. You don't know. No, no, no. You did something. You, you increased the kinetic energy of those particles, and you had more collisions. Now, listen. We're going we're gonna to summarize all this because you guys are all screwy on this, and they've asked questions about it. If I doubled the rate, what did I do to the number of collisions? I increased them is, is the correct answer. How, by how much? If I doubled the rate, how much did I increase the collisions by? I don't know. No, you have no idea. You just don't know. No, you don't know. Now let's try once more. So if I double the rate, I know my kinetic energy went up, but not I don't know by how much. How much? I don't know. Could be any amount. If I double the rate, I increase the velocity, the average velocity in my particles. So I'll do average velocity. I don't know what that looks like, but that's an average velocity. Went up. How much? I don't know. If I double the rate, how many of my particles, my substrate, reach the transition state? So now you all just not thinking. Now you just stop being robots. I freaking hate robots. Actually, I really like robots. So I'll take that back. <laughs> I just hate when students become robots. I don't think robots. But let's try this again. If you made product, did you have to go through the transition state? Yes. Do you get that? So if you made product, here's my reaction, here's my product. You went through the transition state. So, my lovelies, if you double the rate, you double the amount of products made, then what happened to the number of substrate that went through the transition state? It had to double. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Got it? Yeah, that was a Roman rule type question they've asked. So they said, oh, when the double, okay, so let's go over this again. We double the rate of reaction, what happens to kinetic energy? Goes up by how much? It goes up. You don't know how much. What happens to collisions? If I double the rate, what happens to collisions? No, they're not the same, dude. They're, they're not the same. If you double the rate, collisions must have increased. But you don't know how much. How much? I don't know. How much? I don't know. You understand? But what you do know is if you double the rate, those whatever substrate they were, they had to get to the transition state before they became product. Got it? So number of collisions increased. How much? I don't know. Could be anything. Could be all different things. Depends on the reaction. Everybody get it? I don't know, we did something. All right, happy times. Okay, so now back to our exothermic reaction. A plus B goes to C plus E. So what happens when you increase the temperature to this reaction? Does it speed up or slow down? Okay, good. Collisions increase speed up. Collisions increase speed up. <laughs> good, good. Now, you don't increase the products. You treat heat like it's a product, so you're going to shift away. So the shot the air says that higher temperatures, the KEQ, will go up or down. At higher temperatures, for this reaction, KEQ will go down. If you increase temperature, you're going to shift left. Got it? Higher temperature... KEQ goes down. KEQ is changed by temperature, 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 temperature. Temperature changes KEQ. If you increase substrate, if you increase reactants, that doesn't change KEQ. It changes your Q, but not your KEQ. Your KEQ is where this thing wants to go. And that's why reactions shift when you increase 
products and reactants because it's trying to get to this ratio called the KEQ. So let's go over this again. Higher temperature, if this is a product, it's going to shift this to the left. We're going to have less product to reactant ratio. And therefore, your KEQ must have done what? Must have gone down. Must have gone down. Got it? And it did. Okay, cool. Now, here's where it gets a little sticky. This is where my brain hurts a little bit for you guys because you guys are like, here, here comes my robots. <laughs> so um, let's try this. If temperature increases for a given reaction, what happens to the KEQ of that reaction? Goes up or down? Ooh, nice, nice. We don't know. Very good. Where's the temperature on? Where's the heat? Show me. What Bring the heat, baby. For an endothermic reaction, if we increase temperature, what happens to KQ? Quicker, quicker, quicker. Increases. Very good. For an exothermic reaction, when temperature is a product, if we increase temperature, KQ goes down. I dig it. I dig it. Everybody get it? But in which case did the Hello. rate increase? Hello. Say hi to Lindsay. <laughs> but in which case did you get to KEQ faster than at the original temperature? Both, 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 both. Do we understand? Because that's what rate is. How fast you get to equilibrium. Ooh, making some progress. Okay. I feel like I'm getting that. Okay. Let's, let's do something really simple. <laughs> Which means this is going to be ugly. You ready for this? You got this. What's the definition of pure water? Pure energy. Boom, 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 boom. What's the definition of pure water? What is the definition of pure water? Page of seven is definitely not the right answer. Because pure means neutral. And if you're neutral... What's the definition of neutral water? What's the pH of neutral water, folks? Good. It's temperature dependent. The pH of neutral water is not always 7. The pH of neutral water is 7 only at 25 degrees. Are you allowed to have water at any other temperature besides 25 degrees? I feel like you are. <laughs> So the definition of neutral water is when H plus equals OH minus. That's the definition of neutral. That's the definition of pure. They're the same thing. These are, these are just, that's what they call it. So in pure water, do you have anything besides water in the pure water? Yeah, you have H plus and OH minus. How much? How much H plus and OH minus do you have in pure water? No. You have no idea. It depends on temperature. Depends on temperature. This number is 10 to the minus 7 only at... 25 degrees. Do you really think that's the only water? No. So now listen. You're pure at 10 to the minus 7. If I take minus a lot of 10 to the minus 7, I get pH of 7. Makes sense, right? But you should know, usually it takes energy to break bonds. Not always, but usually it takes energy. If I add energy to water, I split it, and I get H plus and OH minus. It's an endothermic process. So my little Chatelier fans... If I increase temperature, so I'm going to start at 25 degrees. If I'm 25 degrees and I start with water, I get 1H plus for every H minus. What's the equilibrium number going to be? 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 7. So listen, if I increase the temperature, we're going up to 80, baby. So if I go up to 80 degrees, did you make more H plus, yes or no? So if I go up to 80 degrees, does my water is my water acidic or basic? What happens? Does it become more acidic or basic when I go up to 80 degrees? <laughs> this thing is bold. This thing doesn't make sense. Okay, let's try it again. <laughs> okay, what the hell, man? I told you this is going to hurt a little bit. All right, listen, 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 listen. 25 degrees, I got 10 to minus 7, H plus 10 to minus 7, OH minus. If I add heat to my pure water, does the pH go up or down? I'm here to tell you you're going to make 
more H pluses. If you make more H pluses, then sure as hell your pH goes down. Does everybody understand that? So when I add energy to pure water at 25 degrees, the pH goes down, folks. So now you can tell me, when I add energy to pure water, when I add heat, when I heat up pure water, is it going to become acidic or basic? It's not going to be acidic. No, it is definitely not going to be acidic, folks. Because for every time you increase an H+, plus, you increase an OH-. minus. It's going to stay neutral. If you heat pure water, it's staying neutral. So now, let's get this straight. Did my H plus go up? Yes. If the pH went down, then the pOH must have gone what? Down. Very good. Down. That's it. Down. Good. Any questions? pH and pOH are directly related and inversely related. pH and pOH are directly or inversely related. I don't know why you, why you all give me answers. I'm giving you a freaking statement. I'm trying to teach you here. Why, why are you being so rude? Stop being rude. <laughs> pH and pOH are directly or inversely related. Do you understand? Apparently not. The answer is H plus times OH minus when it is under isothermic conditions will always equal what? Please don't write 10 to the minus 14. It will hurt my feelings. It will always equal KW. And KW is a moving target. Just like all KEQs, they shift with temperature. Temperature, temperature, temperature. The KW, thanks for sharing that, Carl. The KW at 25 degrees is 10 to the minus 14. And you need to memorize this. These are memorized. But these are, that's no other temperature. No other temperature at all. So let's get this straight again. So listen, listen, listen. What you're not grasping yet, and you need to, is that neutral water is just H plus equals OH minus. And what you're not grasping is that happens at different pHs depending on the temperature. There's only one temperature where that happens at a pH of 7 is 25 degrees. Okay, so now listen. Now I can't trick you anymore because we got a lot of shit to cover and, and I don't want to get you guys screwed up. So let's get this straight. Listen. So, so now I'm actually trying to get this in your head. If I have water at 25 degrees and it's pure, when I heat it up, am I going to make more H pluses or more OH minuses? Same, 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 same. Good. So if I'm going to make the same amount and I start it equal, when I heat it up to 10 degrees, won't I be equal? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. So listen. Listen and freaking get this down, folks, because I need your brains to get this down because I want to cover a lot of things tonight. If I heat water, if I have pure water, which means H plus equals OH minus at 25 degrees, which means there's 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 7. When I heated it up, I made equal amounts of H plus and OH minuses. Therefore, my water is still pure. My water is still H plus equals OH minus. Yes, the pH does change because your H plus changes. Because when you pee on something, it's minus the log of it. pH doesn't give a shit about pOH. They're two different things. So if your H plus changed, which it did when you increased the temperature, your pH went down. So the pH of neutral water is certainly not 7 at 80 degrees. Listen, this pH 7 was neutral. When you heated it up to 80 degrees, did your H plus go up or down? It went up. So your pH went down. So what is the pH of water at, at 80 degrees? It's like 6.5. So if you have water at a pH 6.5 at 80 degrees, it's neutral. Neutral meaning that H plus H equals OH minus. Do you have to memorize this number? No. You have to understand that it's not 7. At what pH is 7 neutral? You guys are so damn brainwashed. pH of 7 is neutral. pH of 7 is there is no other neutral. And, yeah, yeah, there are. There are other neutral points. And 25 degrees is not the only temperature. Okay, so let's try it again. So now listen. Listen to the questions and let's get this right, folks. Let's get, like, everyone getting on the same page here. If I have water at 25 degrees and I heat it, what's going to happen to the pH of that water? Is it going to go up or down? The pH is going to 
go down. Why does the pH go down? Correct, correct, correct. Because the H plus increases. Now, at the same time you made more H plus, what else did you make? You made more OH minuses. Everybody understand? If OH goes up, what happens to POH? It goes down. So when you change temperature, pH and POH behave the same way. So they're directly related when it's not isothermic. So when you change the temperature, pH and POH are directly proportional. They're related. But when you hold temperature constant, those two combinations are going to equal a KW. So now let's try one last thing. I think we're getting it hanging a little bit. There's one statement you need to write down, and that's that the pH of neutral water is temperature dependent. So when somebody says, what's the pH of neutral water, your answer should be when H plus equals OH minus. And you need to memorize a pH of 7 at 25 degrees, but any other temperature, it's not pH 7, folks. So if you got your little hot tub there, if you got a hot tub at 25 degrees, I'm not hanging with you. Like, I mean, who the hell wants a hot tub at 25 degrees? Come on, man. Put your hot tub up at damn like, you know, 104 degrees. <laughs> so bottom line, will boil the hell out of y'all. So 39 degrees, there you go. So the bottom line is this pH neutral water is temperature dependent. Okay, so what's the KW at 80 degrees? What's the KW at 80 degrees? Well, if you want your pH of your hot tub, yeah, it's going to be about 6.5 if you want it neutral. What's the KW of water at 80 degrees? David, how the hell are you getting that, dude? If H plus equals OH minus, and I'm making more of both of them, where the hell are you getting that from? Come on, fix that shit, dude. So, oh, forget about this. Don't, no, don't look at that. I don't want you to look at that. <laughs> don't, look at that. Yeah, don't, don't, don't look at that. I want you to think of it in terms of this number here. Is it going to be bigger or smaller than 10 to minus? It has to be greater than 10 to minus 14. KW, definition of KW is H plus times OH minus. Everybody feeling it? Which went up? Which went up? The H plus or OH minus at 80 degrees relative to 25? Both went up. If they both went up, what the hell happened to KW? It went up. So would it surprise you if it was like 10 to minus 13? It shouldn't, because it is. <laughs> Got it? So the funny thing is you guys are very comfortable with the fact that, oh, yeah, no problem. The shot of principle, increased temperature, the ship shifts this way. And then as soon as I say, what happens when I increase temperature to the H plus? You guys are like, uh, stays the same. I'm like, what? <laughs> you got, I mean, for some reason, this water reaction really gets you, and they put this passage on the test about a gazillion times because it really screws with people. But it's a perfect example of the Schottley air in action. So the Schottley air principle says, at higher temperature, I'm going to make more H plus and more OH minus. I'm going to stay neutral. And if I'm going to stay neutral, H plus equals OH minus. But if I increase H plus, pH goes down. If I increase OH minus, pH goes down. So now here comes the fifth bottle of these prongs. Ready? Oh, boy, it's going to hurt my brain a little bit. I've got some water at a pH of 7, and it's at 3 degrees. Is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Let's go with what it definitely is not. Let's, it can't be neutral. It can't be neutral. So now listen, here's how you do this problem, because you all giving me, I'm, I'm getting like every other answer is opposite, which is terrifying. I know why I'm writing 80 degrees. You got me all flustered now. <laughs> what number should you think about? 25 degrees. So you think about 25 degrees, right? Everybody think about 25 degrees. Okay, that's enough. So if we have that H2O plus heat goes to H plus plus OH minus. We know this is 10 to minus 7. We know this is 10 to minus 7 if we were at 25 degrees, correct? Correct. But when we're at 3 degrees, which way does Le Chatelier say, left or right? Quicker, quicker, quicker. Le Chatelier says lefty, lefty, lefty. We're going to decrease temperature. So what happened to your H plus when we shift to the left? It went up or down. For neutral water, it went up or down. It went down. And therefore, the pH went up. What happened to your pOH? Well, if pH went up, pOH goes up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're getting the hang of it. So when the temperature is lower, the pH and the pOH. So now listen. That means that pH of neutral water at 3 degrees would be – give me a number. Just make some shit up. Give me a number. Today we good. 
No, 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 girl. It's not gonna be way. It's not gonna be a hot. It's not gonna be crazy like that. No, no. We're talking like yeah. It's it's within. It's, it's still under eight. You're still gonna be another one unit away. So maybe it's like seven point eight, seven point five. That's fine. It's not gonna be like twelve or thirteen, but it's gonna be like seven point eight. Like it's a noticeable difference, but it's not crazy. So does everybody get that the pH in neutral water is about seven point eight at three degrees? Do you understand that? So if it's seven point eight, is it basic acidic or neutral? No, no. I just told you it's <laughs> no. Stop with these horrible answers. At three degrees, it's neutral. That's what I just told you. <laughs> it's neutral at seven point eight. That's your neutral point. So if you're at a pH of seven, look. Remember, the H plus went down, so the pH went up for neutral water. So if you're at a pH of seven, somebody slipped you some acid. You understand? So you have, if you have water to pH of 7 at 3 degrees, it's acidic. It's acidic. Must understand this concept, folks. Must see TV. So please, everybody get your brains together and really hit this, car, this hard. Must understand this concept. So write to yourself, pH of 7 at 3 degrees, my water is acidic, and just write why. And go over it, and you'll get it, you'll lose it, you'll get it, you'll lose it. But you need to know, you need to know it because if you saw this on the test for the first time, you'd be like, "What? pH of is always neutral." No, the take-home point is this: the pH of neutral water is temperature dependent, just like any other KEQ. I love it. <laughs> okay, now I get to scramble your brains a little more. Um, well, just for shits and giggles. Okay, forget what we just did and don't reverse it. Got it? So listen, if I tell you I have a water at a pH of 7 at 8 degrees, what sure as hell is it not? And don't just remember what we just did. Try and reason it out, please, so you get smarter. It's not neutral. Now, listen. Your set point, your new zero, your new zero, your new zero is higher or lower than 7. Your new zero, what happened to your H plus? From, and again, we're comparing 25 degrees because we know that's a pH 7. If you had pure water at 25 degrees, there's pH of 7. H plus went up, OH went up. So if H plus went up, pH went down. So is it fair to say your new set point might be like a pH of, I don't know, 6.5 or something like that? Is that fair to say? Is that everybody? get that so listen if i have water listen please and give me the right answer because this is giving me a little bit of brain damage if i have water at eight degrees and it's a ph 6.5 is it acidic or basic hallelujah no 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 stop giving me these shitty answers i won't mention names alex <laughs> caroline <laughs> come on man no, I just talked the shit out of this, man. Come on. No, Julia. No. Man, too, Julia. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen. <laughs> Guys, please freaking pay attention. <laughs> please pay attention. If I <laughs> if I have water at 80 degrees and it's a pH 6.5, we just showed you, we being me, that it's neutral because the H plus went up, therefore the pH went down. And I'm telling you, this is the set point. This is when it's neutral. So if you did have water at a pH of 7, that is not neutral. What has to be true in this water at 80 degrees pH of 7? There has to be more OH minus than H plus because the set point is 6.5. Okay, so here is the take-home point. Take-home point, what's up, Emma? The take-home point is this. Take-home point is the pH, the set point, the pH of neutral water is temperature dependent. The set point goes up when temperature increases, right? No, the H plus goes up, the set point goes down because H plus and pH are always opposite. When you have an X and you pee on X, it's always gonna be opposite. So the set point goes down when temperature increases because H plus increases. Okay, so now let's bring this home with one more thing that hopefully doesn't damage our brains too much. If somebody said to you, pH and pOH are directly or indirectly related, what would you say? Oh, shit. <laughs> How 
How about yes? How about yes? Can you just say yes? <laughs> no, no, listen, guys. What the hell, man? Is this a true statement? H plus equals O times OH minus equals KW. Is that a true statement? Um, it's partially true. It's only true for what? Only true. Not at 25 degrees. Under any given uh, at a given temperature. At a given temperature. Got it? At a given temperature. This is only true at a given temperature. Got it? Is it true that when H plus goes up? So if I told you. I had H plus go up and OH minus go up. Would you be like, oh my God, that violates this? Because this says H plus goes up, OH goes down, because that's a constant. Is, can this happen? Can H plus and OH minus go up? Yes. What happened to temperature? In this case, temperature did what? Temperature increased. So I'm going to try my statement again, which didn't go over so well at all. If somebody told you that H plus and OH minus are directly and indirectly related, would you, would you be like, oh my God, you're full of crap? Or would you be like, yes? You'd be like, true, true, true. I like it. I can finally say true again. Good, 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 good. I love it. Okay. So at isothermic, they are inversely related. One goes up, one goes down. And when it's non-isothermic, they're directly related. Hallelujah. So if somebody says to you, what's the pH in neutral water? There's only one response that makes sense. What is it? Temperature dependent, temperature dependent, temperature dependent. If you did not get that, review it, guys, because they hit this. It's part of a shot lier. It tests a lot of these beautiful things. I feel beautiful, I don't think. All right, cool. woo All right, here we go. Back to Delta G and, and these, these KEQ stuff. Ammonia is a base. Right? And there's three types of bases you should know. Ammonia is a base. Why is ammonia considered a base? Why is ammonia considered a base? Um, because the electrons are accepting a proton. Yes. So the ele so these it's accepting a proton. Who said that? If you accept a proton, who said that? Bronze said said that. Bronze said right. Not Julia, Julia, a Julia acid. <laughs> so, okay, let's step back. OH minus is a base, H plus is an acid. Like that, like we're going to go into basics here, right? Get it? Basics, it's pretty good. So, who wants the proton? Obviously, that does. So, a Bronsted, Bronsted's all about protons, folks. A Bronsted acceptor is a Bronsted base. Got it? So, this shows that ammonia is a Bronsted base. But now it's also donating its electrons to the proton. And Louis, Louis, that E in Louis stands for electrons. So who wants electrons, an H plus or an OH minus? I know, I know yeah, an H plus wants electrons, so that's a Lewis acid. So this shows that it's also a Lewis base. Got it? So Louis, think of H plus and think of OH minus. And think of electrons for Louis and think of bronze base. Now, if you dissociate and generate an OH minus, you're Arrhenius. So Arrhenius would be something like calcium hydroxide or something like that, okay? So calcium hydroxide dissociates and it's, it's an Arrhenius, okay? By the way, calcium hydroxide dissolves best in basic, acidic, or neutral conditions. Calcium hydroxide dissolves best in basic, acidic, or neutral. So they'd be good. What does it dissolve best in? No, no. Okay, what the hell, man? I just talked the shit out of Le Chatelier. If I give you an H+, plus, I destroy this and make water, and Le Chatelier says go this way. That's simple. So let's try this again. Calcium hydroxide dissolves best in acidic, basic, or neutral. Acidic, 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 acidic. Acidic. Get rid of product. When I protonate an OH-, minus, I make water, it's gone. A bye bye And if it's gone, Le Chatelier says shit. <laughs> Got it? Any question about that? So, long story short, calcium hydroxide dissolves better in basic acidic or neutral environments. You better damn well know acidic. All right, now, back to my beautiful ammonia. So what I'm showing you here is ammonia is a base. It's all about the base. So ammonia is a base because it's donating its electrons. That's a Lewis. 
it's not Arrhenius because it's not breaking apart into OH minuses. Got it? So it's not Arrhenius because it's not breaking apart into OH minuses. But it is certainly a Lewis, and it is certainly a Bronsted. Everybody feeling this? Arrhenius, Louis E for electrons, Bronsted's all about the protons. I like it. Three types of bases, three types of acids. Now, this reaction is favorable or no? It's a base, so is this reaction favorable? Obviously. Anytime I say the word obviously, I'm tricking you guys. So you should really kind of learn that. And I'm, I'm actually quite shocked, Julia, that you don't know that. <laughs> so let's try this again. Obviously, if ammonia is a base, and we're going to get some OH minuses, is this reaction favorable? This reaction sure as hell not favorable. And the reason why it's not favorable is because ammonia is a weak base. And uh, here it comes. We're going to come back to that slide in a second. What's the definition of a strong acid? What's the definition of a strong acid? Y'all should remember this. We learned it in such a crappy way. What's the definition of a strong acid? Yeah, Emma, that's not a quantification, though. Low pKa. That's like saying it's a low pKa. It doesn't mean anything. What's the definition of a strong acid? Should we know this? We should damn well know this. Oh, God. Really, Julia, like, honestly, <laughs> it's exactly, really, really, oh, God. Favors product is a good definition. No, Sarah, no, 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 nothing, no, okay, okay, oh, stop, okay, Kenneth, no, 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 no more. Oh, you don't want us to say fully dissociated. Allie, I sure as hell don't because it's wrong. I don't want you to say wrong things. You're absolutely correct, and it hurts my brain when you do. So, look. Which one's stronger, HCl or HI? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Because the I minus is bigger and can stabilize better, right? So if it's true that that's stronger, let me try this. Which one dissociates more in water, HI or HCl? HI, but about 1,000 times. So let's, let's just poo-poo on that answer right away that, it, that a strong acid fully dissociates because that's just a crap answer. Got it? What acid fully dissociates? None. What acid fully dissociates? None. If you have a solution of HCl, you'll still have covalently bound HCl, and you'll still have covalent HI. And you'll have a shit ton more of the HCLs than the HIs because this dissociates. It's about a 1,000 times stronger. You understand? So listen. What you screwed up was that here's the problem. They didn't really, and, and the MCAT knows this, and they love to test this concept. If I take five moles of HCl and stick it into a liter, how many H pluses do I get? If I take five moles of HCl and stick it into one liter, how many, what's the concentration of H plus going to be? Yeah, it's not going to be five. It's going to be like 4.99. Got it? And if I take five moles of HI, what's, this, what's it going to be? It's going to be 4.9999. Get it? So the point is this. You need to know that nothing fully dissociates, and you need to know that there's always going to be some left over. But what you also need to know is that when we do, if you plugged in minus the log of H plus and you plugged in five versus 4.99, you get the same answer for the most part, uh, out to like five or six decimal points. So what you guys screw up is the assume. We assume full dissociation, which is fine for calculations, but not fine to understand actually how the science is working. Because sometimes that HCL stays behind and reacts. So the assumption is full dissociation. Okay, so let's try this again. What acid fully dissociates? No, 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 no. Love it. Love it. So what do we do? How do we get this strong acid definition, which you need to memorize? Chlorine, chlorine, bromine, ionine, fluorine doesn't count. HCl, HBr, HI. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic. So fluoric acid, H2SO4, nitric acid, and perchloric acid, right? HNO3, HClO4. So all of these guys, why are they strong? What makes them strong? And that means that there's a definition. Oh, and there is a definition, and it's quantifiable. So what makes them strong? What makes an acid strong? The quantifiable means there's a number. What number makes these acids strong? Weak conjugate bases is just it's wrong. 99, okay, so, okay, here we go. It's this simple. 
Here are the nasty. I'll call it H1. And it goes to H plus plus A1. And then here's another acid, H2. Folks, you really need to know the definition of strong acids. But what is large, Kenneth? That's what I'm trying to get at. Like, what does that mean? It has to be quantifiable. Quantifiable means give me the damn number. Qualifiable means, okay, so here we go. If I generate, if I throw 100 of these in here, and at equilibrium, I got 49 of these and 51 and 51. And at equilibrium, I got 51 and 49 and 49. Science tells us what about HA1 versus HA2? Well, if this is equilibrium, the products are favored over the reactants, and here the reactants are favored over the products. Feeling it? And that last I checked, that means the KEQ is going to be what? Which is a KA. Ah, uh, now we got it. No one's got it? When the KA is greater than 1 and when the KA is less than 1. That's the definition of strong, folks. Strong means K is greater than 1. Weak means K is less than 1. That's it. And don't forget, K can never be negative. You can't have negative products in reactants. That's not a thing. Got it. What about I? <laughs> no, that's not a thing in science. <laughs> well, not this science. So strong Ka means you just listen to me. You need to own the definition of strong acid. Strong acid dissociates greater than 50%. That's the definition. Strong acid ionizes. Ionizes becomes ions greater than 50%. Strong acid has a Ka greater than one. Products and reactants, more products and reactants at equilibrium. Strong acid has a delta G that's negative. Delta G that's negative because the products are favored over the reactants. Strong acid, if your Ka is like 10 squared, as in like HCl, or 10 to the fourth, as in like, or 10 to the fifth, as in like um, H, HI, then your pK is negative. Strong, that's why they came up with a scale, folks, to show you right away when something has a negative pKa and it's dangerous. That's literally why they came up with a scale. These are the definitions of strong acids, and you need to know every one of those damn definitions really own it. So it's quantifiable. You know, the, the strange thing is this, that not many acids hover around 1. They're like, what if it's 1.1? 1 .1? No, nobody really does that. Either an acid is like 10 to the 4th, or it's like, you know, 2 times 10 to the minus 5. You understand? Which is like 1 over 200,000. Get it? Okay. What should you know? You should memorize the strong acids. There's six of them. HCl, 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 nitric, sulfuric, hydroic, hydroic, hydroic. Got it? Should you know them by name? Yes. What should you know about all these? They all have K is greater than 1. They all have PKs that are negative. What else should you know? They greater. They dissociate greater than 50%. They ionize greater than 50%. Their delta Gs are negative. Oh, I'm feeling it. It's a lot of words. Okay. <laughs> so... Long story short, the bases. Let's do the strong bases. This should be fun. Strong bases, what do you know about them? Tell me what you know about a strong base. Go. What's the definition of strong base? Somebody give me some good answers, please. Strong base. KB greater than 1. I like it. Good job, Strong. KB greater than 1. Dissociate greater than 50%. What else you know? Ionize greater than 50%. Oh, my God. I feel like I know this. Um, PKB is what? Zero. Less than zero. PKB is negative. I like it. I think we got them all. Six. Six and six, baby. Sodium hydroxide. Now, these aren't the only ones, but these are the ones you should expect to memorize. R minus. Green guy. Green guy. When you rip off a proton off a carbon, it gets pissed off. RO minus. Oxygens don't want to lose protons either, believe it or not. And NH2 minus. But R minus is crazy strong, as you guys know. NH2 minus and hydrides. Hydrides are strong. That's six. What do you know about all these? KB is greater than 1. They just associate greater than 50%. Okay. Now, my lovelies, we're ready. You're armed and dangerous. What do you know about this reaction? What do you know about this delta G of this reaction, folks? Who's favored, products or reactants? Is ammonia weak or strong? Reactants, reactants. Ammonia is weak. So the KB is what? Less than 1. Would it surprise you if I told you the KB was like 2 times 10 to the minus 5? That means for every one product, you only or it takes you 200,000 reactants to make one freaking OH. Don't be surprised if that's right. <laughs> Got it? You have to memorize it. Just know KB is less than 1 and know that it's considerably less than 1. 
So KB plus one, what do you know about TKB? Well, that's positive, isn't it? TKB is greater than zero. Positive. What else you know? You know that the delta G is positive because the reactants are favored over the products. Got it? Anyway, of course a weak acid is not spontaneous. Of course not. We, we just talked about this. It's the same thing with weak bases. Of course. Of course. Okay, so let's try this again. What do you know about acetic acid? You should know acetic acid. It's a very important acid in your body. We do everything with acetic acid. So many things. Acetic acid is ethanoic acid. Get it in your freaking brains. What do you know about acetic acid, folks? Is that on the list? No. <laughs> what do you know about acetic acid? We are strong. Today we good. Why are you writing strong, dude? Why are you writing strong? Look at my damn list. Copy that list. Take a picture of it. HCL, HBR, HI, Chris Ford, JNO3, HCL4. Come on, man. It's not on the damn list. If it's not on the list, what do you know about acetic acid? Come on. What's the KA of acetic acid? Give me a number. Today be good. Lesson one. Would you be shocked if it was like four times 10 to the minus five? Would you be like, oh my God, no. Would you be shocked? No, because that's it. Would you be shocked if the pKa of this thing was like 4.6? Would you be shocked? No, because it's positive. Should you memorize this? No. Should you know the k is less than one? Should you know the pKa is positive? Yes. Why? What's the delta G of this reaction? What's the delta G? See, here's the thing that you guys like, and, and not just you. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure I, I was this way at one point in my life, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> no offense, but take it. Point is this that you guys think that delta G positive means the reaction doesn't occur, and that, that is not what that means at all. This word spontaneous and not spontaneous sucks because it has nothing to do with being spontaneous or not. It just has to do with who's favored. A delta G positive just means that you're going to have more stable reactants than products, so the reaction wants to go backwards. That's all. The reaction wants to get the reaction. It doesn't mean the reaction won't happen. So it doesn't mean that if I put acetic acid in water, it won't generate protons. It just means I'm not going to generate a lot. And the odd thing is, remember when we had HCl and I said, hey, if I put five in here, I pretty much get five. That's the assumption. Well, when I put five acetic acids in here, I lose some of them, right? And what is five minus X? Well, that's pretty much five. Because I told you nothing hovers around one. So you assume for your concentration calculations that the H plus didn't change very much. That relative to the acetic acid that you put in. So 5 minus X is 5. It's the total opposite of what we did for the Strongs. With the Strongs, we're like, we're just going to assume there's no more covalently bound HCl and HI, even though we know there is. And we got to be able to know that because they're going to ask it in a word question. Better known as a word problem. Word. All right, so is this reaction spontaneous, just to know? Not no. Hell no. Why is it hell no? Because it's not on the list. And you better damn well know our quintessential weak acid, acetic acid, and, and, um, and ammonia. Now, I'm going to ask you something, and you guys are just going to give me a little bit of brain damage on it. So let's, let's think about it before you give me those answers. So, yeah, let's just do titrations in the middle of this, because that makes a lot of sense, Julia. What the hell, dude? <laughs> so let's talk about this. Acetic acid. What's the conjugate base of acetic acid? Acetate, and you should know it's acetate. Got it? The conjugate base of acetic acid is acetate. Now, is acetate weak or strong? It's the conjugate base of a weak, so acetate is what? Okay, stop with the strong shit. Come on, man. Did, did you not see the damn list I just gave you? I gave you a freaking list. Do you see the list? Here's your bases. What's it say right there? It says strong. Do you see freaking acetate? Anybody see acetate here? Hello? Hello? Acetate, no, no freaking acetate there. So let's try it again. Acetate is weak or strong? Weak, 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 weak. Do you understand? So I don't know where the hell you learned this stupid shit, but I, I, let's let's get this out of your brain. The conjugate of a weak is weak. The conjugate of a weak is weak. Got it? I will prove it to you. At 25 degrees, the Ka times Kb, just like H plus times OH minus, will equal 1 times 10 to minus 14. If I told you the Ka of acetic acid is 4 times 10, let's do 2 times 10 to minus 5. This way the numbers are even, a little easier because I don't want to get you guys screwed up on numbers yet. If I told you the Ka of acetic acid is 2 times 10 to minus 5, would you be surprised? No, because it's less than 1. 
Well, if that's the case, then what's the case B of ST? The KB of ST is 0.5 times 10 to minus 9, which is 5. Make that bigger, make that smaller. Look at the KB of ST. Would you say that's weak or strong? That's weak as hell. Do you understand? So where you guys learn this stuff just crushes me. Like I, I mean, they, and they drill it into your brains. Okay, so let's make sure we understand this. There's no such thing as strong or weak. Let's make sure we understand this. The conjugate of a weak is what? Weak, 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 weak. The conjugate of a weak is weak. The KB equation shows it, but it's not on the list. So now listen. Here's where you guys get screwed up. So HCl, right, breaks apart into H plus and Cl minus, and Cl minus is our conjugate base. That is not a base. It's a conjugate base because it gave up the proton, but that is called the spectator. And it's called the spectator because it's so weak that it doesn't even contribute to pH. So if you have a jar full of chlorine minuses, your pH is really not going to change very much at all. So the conjugate of a strong is a spectator, which means it doesn't really contribute to pH because its KB will be so freaking small that it might as well just be neutral water. Do you understand? So the conjugate of a weak is weak. The conjugate of a strong is a spectator. Yes. Cool. All right. Now, let's talk about, well, if we can't get rate from looking at a delta G or a KEQ, which you cannot, then we do this rate law thing. These are fun. Rate equals concentration of A to the X. X is called order. B to the Y, C to the whatever, and there's a K in front. Okay, now listen. For an endothermic reaction, Does that K go up or down? For an endo, no, let's do exothermic. For an exothermic reaction, does that K go up or down? Not question mark, David. Own it. <laughs> Confidence, baby. <laughs> I'll take factorial. There you go. <laughs> I was waiting for the fact. Am I good or what? I knew that factorial was coming. Folks, that is the K that alters with changing temperature. If the temperature goes up, rate will do what, my lovelies? Increase, 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 increase. Notice I just gave you exothermic reaction to screw with you. So that K is the thing that changes with temperature. So that K is per given temperature. At every single temperature, that K is different. And that K is going to talk about the number of collisions, it's this, it's that. So that K is going to increase with increase in temperature, period, because there's more collisions. Everybody understand it. Now listen, what happens to Y when we increase temperature? What happens to that Y when you increase temperature? Nothing. Nothing stays the same. That Y, that X, that A, they're all, it's all per given temperature. Got it? Okay, so now let's let's make sure, let's go back to this for a second. So if I have a reaction and I have two substrates, A and B, if I increase the concentration of substrates, does the rate go up or down? Has to go up. There's more collisions. If you have more particles, there's more collisions. You understand? So if you increase the concentration of substrates, the rate goes up. Got it? If I increase the concentration of substrate, does your KQ go up or down? Your KEQ, up or down? I got one neither. Rate is not related to KEQ. So did the KEQ go up or down when I increased my substrate? Okay. You guys get the KEQ is a number you look up in a book? So you see, like, I got five more 
A and three molar B. Hang on. Um, oh my God, the book's rewriting itself. There's a different KEQ. No, A and B have a set KEQ. You understand? It's in a, it's in a damn book. So <laughs> are you allowed to put five molar and three molar or two molar and one molar? Yeah. And they're always going to have the same KEQ. They're always going to have the same ratio product reactants at equilibrium. Do you understand? They'll get there faster. If there's more of them, they'll get there faster if it's a higher temperature. But it's always going to reach the same ratio. That's what KEQ is. So I don't care how much you put in, they're going to get to this ratio that they want to get to. So the point is, when you change the concentrations, you change what's called Q. Q is product to reactant ratio at any given time. You change that. But KEQ is a number. I always think about that. Like, if you, if you guys are thinking KEQ changes, it's like, well, if I put 5 molar and 3 molar, well, i, I got to look up a different KEQ. Well, what if I put 2 molar? Oh, i got to get a different No. KEQ is a damn number in the book. It does not change. Got it? It's not magic. So... The only thing that changes for KEQ is when temperature is affected. Temperature affects KEQ always. So what changes KEQ? Temperature, 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 temperature. If I increase the concentration of products, what's going to happen to my KEQ? Up or down? Nothing, 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 nothing. If I increase my temperature, what happens to how fast I get to KEQ? I will get there faster, 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 faster. I really think we're making progress. Does this K, which is not a KEQ and a total different thing, does this K have anything to do with temperature? Yes or no? I would say everything would be a good answer. Absolutely. Good, 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 good. Okay, dokie. So, how do we get the rate? We can look at the activation energies. That'll tell us relative rates. Or we can do an experiment. Time to experiment, my lovelies. A, B. What you're doing with this, now, follow along. Don't do it the way you, you do it in your head. I need you guys to do it because we got to do more advanced problems, so i got to actually teach you what you're doing. Got it? If that made any sense, just listen to what the hell I'm telling you to do. <laughs> just, just do what the hell I tell you to do. That's all I ask. That's not too much. All right. So long story short, we got this beautiful reaction. And we can see, if we want to see what A does to the rate, let's hold B constant. Because if you change A and B, how the hell do you know if it was A or B? Got it? <laughs> now, Caroline, I drink coffee. Um, I drink, in the morning, I drink two cups usually. One, one or two cups, and that's it. And I never have another cup. Lavaza, baby! <laughs> you all hear all about Lavaza. Lavaza saved me during this damn pan epidemic. Because I'm telling you, a pandemic. Because Lavaza is just heaven. One of my friends introduced me to Lavaza, and I was just like... Oh, ooh. <laughs> I'm like the elf with the best cup of coffee. Lavaza, heaven. All right, here we go. Point is this. There's a point to this. Yeah, there's a point to this. When I, what you're really doing here, I don't need you. I need you to do this fast and be like, okay, if I double A, this goes up by four. Two to the X is four. X is two. You understand? So what did I do? I doubled A. Rate went up by four. Two to the X is four. Good. No, I need you to understand what you're doing. For different kinds of questions. What you're really doing is this. What you're really doing is you're plugging in everything from trial to. And you're saying, okay, the rate, which is 8 times 10 to minus 4, equals K times 4. This is what you're doing. Follow along. Oh, no, I'll do it this way. No. Trust in me that the problems are going to be a lot freaking harder than this. Or they might be this, and then we don't have to do this. So that's the first thing. But then you're looking for something that divides nicely, like reaction 1. So reaction one says two times, what's the minus? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what the hell it is. I'm saying these are the ones we were using. I was doing that. So, oh my God. Two times 10 to minus four equals K times two to the X times two to the Y. Everybody see that? Now, Scott Robert's favorite thing to do in the world, Kenta Kento, Kenta Kento, Kenta Kento. And what do we get? Four to the X over two to the X is just two to the X equals four. That's what you're doing when you're like, I double this, this goes up by 4, 2 to the x equals 4. This is what you're doing. Do you understand? And the reason I need you to know that, so we got x equals 2, is because they're not always going to hold both constants. So that means, what trials am I going to use to calculate my y? What trials are you going to use? You're going to use 3 and 1. So we're going to say 6 to the x. I'm going to do them both out at the same time. 
6 to the X over 2 to the X. Feeling it? K's over K's cancel. And then we get 4 to the Y. This is trial 3. Follow along. And this is trial 1 over 2 to the Y. But we know what, we know what um, X is already because we already did X. You understand? We already got what X is too. So then we get, is this type of problem only for an irreversible? No. Not at all. For any reaction. No, not at all. So then what do we get over here? We get equals 36. We got to put them in the same base. Make that bigger. Make that smaller. Equals 18. 36 over 2. I probably should write 36 over 2. All right. Everybody understand what we did? All we did was took trial 3. I don't want to take 3 and 2 because I don't want to do 3 halves to the x. I don't like 3 halves to the x. I don't mind 3 to the x. That's nice. So we get 36 over 2. So in the end, what do we get? We get 3 to the x times 2 to the y equals 18. But we know 2 to the y is what? Y is what? Can I get a what, what? Y is... Y is 2 to the x, 3 to the x. So what is, what is x? Well, yeah. So x is 2. We already calculated it. So we get 3 squared times 2 to the y equals 18. So 2 to the y equals 9. No, 2 to the y equals 2. So y is 1. Everybody understand? We'll do another. So the point is this. I hope you can see this and just go, okay, 3 to the x times 2 to the y. Well, I know 2 to the y is already 2 equals 18. I hope you can see that. So it's 3 to the x times 2 to the y equals 18. And I already got x being 2, so it's really just 3 squared times 2 to the y equals 18. 3 squared is 9, so we get 2 to the y equals 2. y equals 1. All right, cool. Let's try it again. Why did I choose 3 and 1? I chose 3 and 1 because they're nicely divisible. That's what I was just saying a minute ago. So I, I, want, I want A to be constant to figure out B, but there's nowhere A is constant. So I can't just find... I chose 1 and 2 initially because... B is not affecting the rate, only A is. Got it? Now I look, oh, shit, A is not constant. I actually said the word shit. A is not constant. So instead, I'm looking for a nice, even, divisible thing. So I don't want to do 6 over 4. You understand? I can't do 2 and 1 because then I, I'm not going to know what B does to the reaction. To find out what B does, I'd like to hold A constant, but there's nowhere to do it. So what are you going to do? You're going to find something nice and easily divisible. 6 over 2 is 3. 4 over 2 is 2. And we already calculated what x was. Cool. Let's try another one because that was exciting. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, of course it has to cross it. There's no other way to do it. Of course. So let's try another one. It's going to be invigorating. And I hope we get hard ones of these because people really suck when these numbers get ugly. But not you guys, because you guys will be exposed to it. Got it? All right, let's get some order. The overall order is X plus Y. Let's get some order here. Go ahead and do it. I'll be back in 20. No. <laughs> I am here for you. These five words I swear are true. Even though I sound like I'm underwater for you. I'll be here. Look, 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 look.
Keep it moving. Who's got an order? What the hell are y'all doing? Come on. We got a lot more to do tonight. What you gonna do? We got more to do. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Getting busy. No, dude, half. Come on, man. What are y'all doing? Oh my god, Scott Roberts, the numbers are terrible. What am I gonna do? <laughs> Come on, man. Look at trial. Look at this. Eight over two is four. So we got four to the x equals two. X is a half. Big deal. Come on. That should have taken about three seconds. Square root of four is two. You understand? Good. What trials are you gonna use now? What trials? Today we good. What trials are you using? Today we anybody? Bueller. Bueller. What trials? One and three. So you're gonna take three. So I get 18 over two, which is nine. Everybody feeling nine? Nine to the one half. Oh my God, that's really complicated. The square root of nine. Times two to the y equals what? 60 over two is 30 last I checked. Does everybody see 60? Can I get a what, what? Bigger 60 there now, make that bigger, make this smaller. Yeah. Oh my God, how do we do that? Two to the y equals what? Square root of nine is three. Two to the y equals 10. B -b 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 bracket two cubed is eight two to the fourth is what 16 i'm closer to 10 than i am to 16 i'm eight i'm bump uh 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 uh, uh. 3.3 sounds good so why is about 3.3 3.3 and 0.5 is about 3.8 i don't know why that took so long but i don't like it one bit i tell you should you know how to bracket two to the y is 10? You should really know how to bracket that. Got it? You should really know two cubed is eight, two to four is 16, somewhere in between, 3.8, looks good. 3.3 .3 plus 0.5, question. Take a picture, lasts longer. I'm done with the rates. They could ask you to solve for k, then you just have to plug it back in. You got to use one of these guys, two to the, so that'd be like two and a half times that, and you should know two and a half is 1.4 anyway, so that shouldn't be bad. So two and a half times two and a half. Can I give it two and a half, two and a half, one point four times one point four, four times fourteen, one and six, get it? Yeah, right. All right. That's how you do rates, guys. Um, get with it. Hopefully you get it. All right, let's learn colligative. Colligative is awesome. Who doesn't love colligative? Colligative properties. Colligative means particles. Properties. Colligative is probably one of the highest yield GCAM topics. It's up there. Colligative is up there. That's why we're ending with colligative tonight. Because it's awesome. <laughs> um, Clicking properties means particles in solution. If it doesn't go into solution, it doesn't count. And there are five colligative properties you must know. I would put them on note cards. Folks, number one thing you do is you do your freaking, you, what do you do? You do your, a, after you're done with my class, you review all your notes. That's what you do. Why? Because I am the most up-to-date creature on this planet when it comes to MCATs. Because guess what? After my students take this test, who do they call? They call their mama. And who's their mama? I'm their mama. And they're going to call their mama, and I'm going to say, what the hell was on that test I didn't teach you? And they're going to say, everything was on the test. I did. Everything was on the test. Literally. I've heard this for years. Everything you taught me, every, I couldn't have been more prepared for that test. Everything was on it. Don't get me wrong. It was a tough test, but there was no outside knowledge I needed besides everything you taught me. I hear that every, year after year after year. What the hell else can I do besides teach you everything that's on this test? That's it. Oh, I heard it was just a reading comp test. That's stupid. It's not a reading comp test. This is a this is a proficiency test to understand that you understand science from undergraduate. All of it. Physics, GChem, OChem, Biochem, all of it. That's what it is, the proficiency test. So how do I know that? Because I have a gazillion students who take it, and not my students do very well. And my students say the same thing. I couldn't have been better prepared for this test. So do what I tell you to do, learn the material. If you're overwhelmed with what I'm teaching, it's expected, especially if it's your first time. I would love to be me and see me and be like, oh, my God, this guy's a lunatic. How did you, does he ever stop? <laughs> he must drink a lot of Lavazza. <laughs> so the bottom line is, after the class, your number one priority, set aside, you know, go have a nice latte and set aside a freaking hour to review all your notes. That's what you should do. My, this is the highest yield stuff you'll have. You need no other content beyond my book. I, I didn't write questions because there's plenty of questions book out there and I don't have time to do all that. So I wrote my content book, all of it and, it, and it's awesome. It's everything that's been on this test. And I know that because I've had thousands of students every year and they tell me the same thing. And if I ever, 
if, if there were ever anything that was on the test that wasn't in my book, if it pops up, it goes right in my book right away. <laughs> so, I mean, it's damn, you know, I mean, I, I, I update the book in a heartbeat. If you find anything that's like kind of wrong or whatever, which you won't, because I've corrected anything that anybody found wrong. You guys were my editors. So the point is, listen to what I say, and your number one thing besides following the homework sheet is to review the class notes. That is the Mac Daddy of life. Got it? Good. Happy with this time. All right, click it. What's it mean? That's my first one. Click it a proper. And if you don't know what the homework sheet is, send an email. Think MCAT is email there, Tom, and be like, hey, I don't know the homework sheet. And I'll be like, here it is. You'll be excited. Click it a proper. Particles in solution. Osmotic pressure sucks. Wherever there's more particles, there's more sucking power. Now, that M is very deceiving because that M is not really a molarity, but it kind of is. It's molarity of particles. So you'll see it sometimes as I M, and sometimes you'll see it as normal. And either one of those is correct. So in other words, without further ado, if I had three molar MgCl2, the normality of MgCl2 is three. That's the normality. Normality is a word that is a characteristic of a molecule. Normal, which three times three, we get nine normal. Normal is a characteristic of a solution. Get it? We care about normal in all our colligative properties. We do not care about normality. So normal is the important one. Clear? So. Osmotic pressure sucks. Wherever there's more particles, that's going to suck water. Osmotic pressure sucks. If you have more particles, there's a way to describe that solution. How do you describe a solution with more particles? So if this is only selective or hermetic solvent, it's called hypertonic. Hyper means more. Hypertonic, more particles. Now, really what's happening is there's less water over here. So water is moving down its gradient because there's less water over here, but we never talk about the concentration of water. That's not a thing. So this solution would be considered hypotonic. So water moving down its gradient is osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure sucks. Wherever there's more particles, water gets sucked over there. Hydrostatic pressure is the opposite. So hydrostatic pressure is a pushing pressure, whereas osmotic pressure is like a sucking pressure. Clear? Osmotic pressure is this pi symbol. So pi is MRT. Sometimes you'll see it I, the Van Hoff constant. The I is actually the normality. That's all that is. I'm going to write this out. Hopefully this, this, will, this will bring it home for you. Normal equals molarity times normality. And normality is sometimes the Van Hoff constant. I put an I there. I like it. Next one. Boiling point elevation. It's hot outside. We're excited. Delta T equals K sub B times little m. Little m is molality. T. Molality is not moles per liter of solution. It's moles of particles per kilogram of solids. Water is the universal solvent, and hopefully we know that one liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. Cool. Freezing point depression. Baby, it's cold outside. Freezing point goes down. Boiling point goes up. That's so why you're to cook in a pasta with some salt. When you add salt to water, the boiling point goes up and the pasta cooks faster. And it doesn't stick as much, <laughs> allegedly. Especially freaking uh, gluten-free pasta. Man, that stuff like clumped together. That is a pain in the ass to cook. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Just saying. So, the next colligative is vapor pressure depression. Vapor pressure depression. Pressure, um, <laughs> my, my in-laws, one of them is gluten-free, so I put some pasta on there. Vapor pressure depression, the pressure goes down when there's particles, and it's due to the solvent. Think about this. An X is the mole fraction of solvent. Or don't think about it, and that's fine, too, because we're gonna, I'm going to make you think about it. Last one is conductance. I'll explain this equation in a sec. Okay, there are five colligative properties. Got it? Osmotic pressure, one point elevation, free point depression, vapor pressure depression, and conductance. Two of them go down, and the rest all go up. 
when there's more particles, okay? Again, we're going to come back to this, this one. Just write it down, get it down, take a picture, fly for me. Now, here we go. Selectively permeable membrane, only permeable to the solvent. In this corner, we've got four molar MgCl2. Two, two, two. In this corner, we've got five molar KCl. Ooh. And I've got five questions. You ready? Which way is the water goal was bone for greater than greater greater and where is the first greatest and where is the conductance greatest? What? Wait, what are you saying? Five applicative properties, folks. Let's take them one by one. Before you do that, you should probably get the what of each solution. Give me a correct science word, please. You should get the what of each solution. Normal. I love it. Love it. I love it when you talk science to me. <laughs> Ten normal. <laughs> and over here is what? Thirteen normal or normal, depending where you're from. So, who sucks? Lefty or righty? Who sucks? Lefty or righty? Lefty sucks. Got it? What do you mean, why? Four times three. I don't know. It's not 13. It's 12. Who wrote 13? Some of you wrote 13. I'm copying what you guys write. Danny, <laughs> students. Four times three is 12. <laughs> Thank you. What the hell? I'm a, I'm not, I won't call out who wrote that because I wrote two. <laughs> Just write what you guys write. Automatic pilot is now off. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Four molar of MgCl2. The normality of MgCl2 is three. You might say the Van Hoff constant is three. Four times three is 12, we get 12 normal. There are 12 moles of particles per liter of solution. Over here, five times two is 10, 10 normal. There are 10 moles of particles per liter of solution. There's more water here, osmotic pressure sucks, so the osmotic pressure greater here. Where's the boiling point greater? Left or right? Left or right? Yeah, higher boiling point over here. Now, which one of these has a boiling point greater than 100? Which one of these has a boiling point greater than 100? Both, 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 because we added particles. The original boiling point was 100, and now it went up. Okay, who has the higher freezing point, left or right? The right one has a higher freezing point because this one has a greater freezing point depression, as in lower. Which one of these freezes at zero degrees? Neither, neither, neither. They freeze at minus something. This one might freeze at minus two. This one freezes at minus five. Get it? So the freezing point is higher on the right because this guy has a higher freezing point depression. But they like to ask which one has a higher freezing point. Now, vapor pressure is the solvent escaping okay listen to this the solvent escaping solutes precipitate they form solids solutes precipitate solvent evolves solvent evaporates and if you could put a piston here and measure how much pressure is pushing that's called your vapor pressure so it's this simple if there's more solute, more particles, there's less solvent. So where's there more solvent, left or right? Right, and that's why that has a higher vapor pressure. The particles take up space and decrease the vapor pressure. Now, charged particles. Conductance is carrying electrons, allowing electrons to flow. Which one has more charged particles? Anybody? Yeah, the one on the left, higher conductance. I like it. You correct. All right. Must understand this concept. Take a picture. Make sure you understand. Click your properties. So tested. If you took a cell and stuck it in fresh water, what happens to the cell? You're fresh. It kisses. <laughs> Danielle, what the hell is that? It kisses who? <laughs> oh, lysis. Okay. It gets big. <laughs> it's called lysis. <laughs> it kisses. That's pretty good, dude. So, describe the solution in fresh water. Describe the solution in fresh water. What solution did you? Hypotonic solution. Very good. So, you put this in a hypotonic solution. The cell is hypotonic, but I didn't ask you to describe that. I just asked you to describe the surrounding solution. The solution is hypotonic. So that's going to suck in water, and the cell's going to end up lysing. 
so you'll get lysis. Very good. Now, if I stuck this in some salt water, and this was a human cell, what happens? Is salt water from the, the, the shrivels? <laughs> There's no shrivel in, in science. No, it's not shrivel. <laughs> That's too personal. Shrinkage is not a thing. So, no, 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 no. Won't swell at all. No, 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 no. Salt water is hypertonic. You should know that, right? We're not camels. So, salt water is hypertonic. Does that suck? Yes or no? Yes, it sucks water. And we don't use the word shrivel. We use the word crenate. So crenate means shrivel, but they will never say shrivel. Got it? Even though it's a shrivel. Don't say shrivel. What does it do? Crenate. Crenate means what? Shrivel. Got it? But don't say shrivel. All right. Cool. Happy All right. Last things last. Let's say that I had some water. And let's say it's pure water. What's its pH? What's its pH? Quicker, quicker, quicker. Oh, my God. Not that shit again. <laughs> what's, its, <laughs> what's its pH? Depends on temperature. Depends on temperature. Hello. If I told you it's pure water and it's a pH of 7, what's the temperature? 25 degrees. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Let's say I have pure water and let's say it's at a pressure of, I don't know, uh, let's go with 120 mmHgs. This is the basic pressure, 120 mmHgs. So there's water, it's evaporating, it's 120 mmHgs. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, huh? I'm going to put some salt in the water. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. And it's going to be a 50, apparently 55. It's going to be a 50, 50 mole to mole ratio. Danielle, this is for you. You asked me this question. It's 50, 50 mole to mole ratio of sodium chloride to water. Well, first things first, did the vapor pressure go up or down? I'm going to call it a better better uh, number. The vapor pressure go up or down? I'll call this P sub T for pure. The vapor pressure goes down because there's just less water. It's called vapor pressure depression. Okay, so what's your new vapor pressure, folks? Show me the vapor pressure. Calculate it, please. So the, if you don't remember, the equation was the pressure of A is some fraction, if it were pure, times the mole fraction of solvent, or apparently solvent. <laughs> what do A and T stand for? Pressure T, cure, cure water. A is over here, ah, uh, over here, ah, uh, yeah, I got nothing on you. <laughs> you want to call it? Pressure T is like totally water. It's like totally water. And this is like uh, a some water. So it stands for uh, some water. No freaking clue, dude. I don't know what it stands for. It's a thing. It stands for a thing. Okay. All right. So in any case, what's your new pressure? Bum ba da dum bum bum bum. Okay. Pause. Uh, crappy answers, guys. Come on. Let's not end the night this way. It's colligative. You have 50 sodiums, 50 chlorines. They're their own particles. And you have 50 waters. Do you understand? So how many total particles would you say there are? One fifty. And of those one fifty, how many particles are water? Fifty. Does everybody understand why this is not a not a half? It's not sixty. It's going to be a third, so it's going to be 40 mmHgs is correct. You understand? Because it's colligative, folks. So what is the mole fraction? The mole fraction of solvent, if you don't know, you need to, is moles of solvent divided by what? Divided by moles of solvent plus moles of particles. No, you don't include H plus and OH minus because they're at like 10 to the minus freaking, they're at like 10 to the minus 7. So it's like saying adding like 1 plus 0.001. So no, you don't add H plus and OH minus in those. Moles of solvent plus moles of particles. Got it? That's total moles. That's the mole fraction. Let's try one more because that was uh, somewhat miserable being that no one got the damn answer right. <laughs> so the pressure over here is at 40. 
All right, let's try it again because this is invigorating. Here we go. Ready? You got some water. She's a nice of water. <laughs> and she got a pressure 400. Wow, well, some pressure over there for that water. We'll call it a piece of tea for the pure water. TP. The pure water. Yeah, I got that for me. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So how do they make this pressure a little bit more of a pain in the ass? They do it by doing, giving you grams. So they'll say there's this many grams, and then you have to know that one kilogram is one liter for water. And yeah, you understand? And you'll have to get the number of moles. They'll be like, oh, there's one liter of water, and then do one kilogram, 1,000 grams divided by 18, and you get the moles. You with me or not? More or less. So I'm, I'm taking shortcuts because they'll make you calculate the moles, and they'll make you know the density. They're not going to give you the density of water. And then they'll give you the number of grams of whatever you put in here. So like in this case, let's put some. Ooh. Let's do a 60 mole. And they'll do a gram ratio too, which is a pain in the ass too. So there'll be like, it's a 50, 50 gram ratio, which means you got to multiply, you got to divide by molecular weight and get mole to mole ratio. Everything in stoichiometry is moles, guys. If you haven't gotten that, then that's sad. 60 mole to 40 mole ratio calcium phosphate. Got it? So we have a new solution, and it's a 60 mole of water to 40 mole of calcium phosphate. And again, don't forget that they probably didn't give you the mole to mole ratio. They probably made you calculate it in grams, but to save time, we're not going to do that. Agree with me. All right, let's get our new pressure, folks. First of all, go up or down. Up or down. Oh. He sees me. I'm down. Up or down? It's going to go down. I agree. Let's get some answers, folks. Oh, oh, I see what's happening here. Face to face with medicine shows. See some very strange numbers. Okay, so what do you got? Well, first of all, you need to know the calcium phosphate is what? Ca3PO4-2. Because phosphate is what charge? Should you know what charge on phosphate is? If you don't, then I'm sad. It's minus 3. You understand? So how many ions do we get? How many ions do we get? Well, we got five times. So how many calciums are in here? I agree. There's there's 200 plus how many? So what's our denominator for our mole fraction? 260. Very good. So it's going to be the pressure is 400 times what? 60 over 260. Because the bottom is going to be 40 times 5, which is 200. But then you can't, you got to include the water, the 60 moles of water. You understand? So there's 260. Yeah. Can't depend on 3 over 23. 1200 over 23 is my answer that I asked of thee. Well, times 50 is what? Why are you using water in the numerator? Because it's a mole fraction of water. Because it's a mole fraction of water? What? Yeah. 313. Thanks. It's a mole fraction of water, guys. What the hell? It's a mole fraction. Why are you using water in the numerator? It's a mole fraction. That's the whole point. Your X of solvent, your solvent is water. So your X of solvent, there's 60 waters for total particles of 40 times 5. Remember, the normal would be 200 plus the 60 waters, so over 260. Cancel, cancel. So 3 over 13 is, is the answer. I love it. So we get 1,200 over 13, well, times 100. 
It's close. <laughs> and then we got to get rid of like eight of them. So what? You understand? 13 times 100 is 1,300. But then we got to get rid of like eight of them because that's like 100. So we got what? About 98 degrees? I like it. So you need a pressure about 98. How come you don't like that? You just like that. Um, should, you have to do, should you be able to do 98 in your head, 98 times 13? Sure. That's just 980 and 270. Does everybody see 980 and 270? 90 and 270 is 1150. 1250 plus 24, 1257. So it's a little high. Maybe 97. I'll go with 97. Yeah. All right, my lovelies. Your pressure's 97. Get it right the first time. That's not the same thing. Oh, peace. I'll see you guys tomorrow night when we're going to. Oh, tomorrow night's bio at least. <laughs> so that's going to be exciting. I will see you guys tomorrow night in bio. If you're new, send an email to thinkmcat.gmail.com, and the world will be a better. Ava, good luck. If you're taking the test tomorrow, you're awesome. I love you guys. You've been so wonderful. Whoever's taking the test tomorrow and the next day, you're awesome. You know who you are. I won't mention names. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm going to miss you guys. I'm so sad. I'm going to get the mic fixed, Colin. Don't you worry. <laughs> yeah. Keep ordering me, dude. Watch. Tomorrow, I'm going to come up with a helmet on. Peace. What's up, Greg? How you doing, man? Scott, peace. It's a, <sighs> um, can you explain why more solute means higher vapor pressure? What, dude? It's a vapor pressure dependent. No, man. It means less. Peace, Sarah. It means less, dude. What the hell? Where, where, what are you looking at? This is 97. 97 is a lower number than four. We put particles in here, right? We put these calcium phosphates, and it went down. Think about it. It's just simple. Here's water, and I got particles evaporating, right? If I had solvent in here and I had the same one liter, the way I look at it is this. You care not about the particles. You care about the solvent. So let's say your particles and water were a one-to-two ratio, right? So let's say for every one water, there's one particle. So it's a one-to-two ratio. If that's the solvent, then what, if this pressure were 10, then it's going to be a new pressure of 5 because there's less water. It's all about the mole fraction of solvent because the solvent is what's evaporating. So when you add particles, they're taking up space. Get it? So it's all about the mole fraction of solvent. So this piece of T is if it were pure. So the pressure over here in A is a fraction of the piece of T. If your mole fraction is 100, then that's why it's 100. Get it? I feel like I get it. Oh, my. All right, everybody. Have a good night. Arrhenius base or acid is you generate a proton. You dissociate to generate an OH or you gen dissociate a proton. So like LIH or something. You give a proton. So HCl is going to give a proton up in water. So if you generate a proton in water or an OH in water, you're Arrhenius. That's the definition of Arrhenius. And I'm sticking with it. Got it? Good. All right, all right. Have a good night, everybody. Carly, what's up? <laughs> Scott Robertez left the building.